Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. Today we're delighted to welcome along Nick O'Sullivan. Nick is the co-founder and MD of Mojave Training, which is a leadership and management training business, and he's also a financial advisor. Now, previously, uh, Nick was in the Marines for 13 years, including four of the Special Forces. And in 2015, he designed and delivered a large-scale multinational training event, which he was virtually awarded an MBE for services to defend. So really pleased to get the chance to speak with you today, Nick. Welcome. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks for having me on. Hello there, Nick. Really nice to meet you. You've had a very interesting uh, life, so I'm looking forward to seeing you hearing about some of the things that you've done. It's all relative. <laughs> yes. So you began by doing a degree in sociology before joining the Marines. And, you know, it's almost as if that doesn't properly follow one from the other, because one tends to associate sociologists with left-leaning passengers, or, or are we just being a bit stereotypical? Yeah, so I'd, yeah, I'd, it'd be really interesting to uh, sort of understand why why that's the case. Why why a lot of people think, oh, if you've done sociology, you you must be not socialist, I guess. Um, but but no, for me, um, I guess it depends partly what sociology is about. For me, sociology is about anyone who's interested in how groups of people work and interact when they come together, um, and it's kind of uh, in terms of political leanings, pretty agnostic in its views. So um, I, d- I went went through my sociology studies with people that were definitely uh, in all political camps, uh, and that made debate and discussion obviously far more interesting as well. So it was great. Um, but no, I, I, I'm not sure that. Also, I'm not sure there is a sort of usual route to the Marines. What was wonderful about about the Marines is um, is the huge variance of people who would join it. Um, some with degrees, some not with degrees, some straight out of school at 16, some much older potentially up to sort of age 30, um, you know, people from, uh, some fairly affluent backgrounds, people from not affluent backgrounds, there was a huge mix and that's kind of what gave, certainly for me, the Royal, Royal Marines, it's, it's massive charm, really. It was a, it was a pleasure to be part of that organization. It felt very egalitarian to me to be in it. Yeah, that sounds, uh, fascinating. Did you have a military background in the family? Oh, no, well, both, both my granddad served, uh, during the second world war, one in the RAF, one in the army, but, but beyond that, you know, they didn't serve for long. Um, and, and not, none of my parents, um, or aunts and uncles did. So, so no, not really. There wasn't really much exposure to the military at all growing up. I mean, I was, I was in air cadets for a few years in my teens, which I really enjoyed. Um. But no, no, no particular military background. I suppose what led me to the Marines later on was um, there were two bits really. There were, you know, at that point in your life, early sort of twenties, I was sort of looking at my life ahead of me and going, right, okay, what what do I want from it? And there were two parts to the answer. One was I want to do stuff for others, and um, I hadn't had the the most difficult upbringing as a child, but it wasn't particularly the easiest either. I got bullied a lot. Um, didn't have the easiest home life. There was some volatility there. Um, my mother struggled with um, alcoholism and, uh, and so it made it very volatile growing up. And so, so I got to my early twenties. I didn't really have much self-esteem, so much self-confidence and I got bullied a lot at school, which is pretty rubbish. And so I wanted to do something that would help me help others to stand up for people that couldn't stand up for themselves. To, um, I wanted to be part of a a team of people that were really motivated to deliver great outcomes. And, and obviously for me, the Marines ticked all of those boxes and it also ticked other boxes, you know, hopefully get to see the world and experience lots of different things. Um, and then in terms of things for, for myself, um, there was a huge part of me that, um, you know, I wanted to address this issue that I, I kind of felt second rate. I didn't feel. I had value, as I say, I had low confidence, low self-esteem. And I thought I, I needed a way to prove to myself as much as anyone else that actually I did have value. So there was, there was almost a deep seated emotional need to, to validate myself. And so the military as a whole appealed to that, you know, to be tested, to be put under pressure, to be put in 
harm's way potentially and prove my mettle as it were. And when I started looking into which bits of the military I might join, then for me, the Marines stood out head and shoulders above that. You know, if I was going to do it, let's, let's go, let's go for it. And let's make sure I can prove to myself I'm worthy of that green beret that has so much, um, attached to it in terms of meaning. So I guess that's what pulled me into, into the ring, mm. you know. Do you think that's a common reason for people to join up to the military? Just thinking about a lot of the prison officers I've worked with who've spoken about how being in the armed forces kind of saved them. There was a, a mm. sense of if they hadn't joined up, they could have quite easily ended up on quite a wayward path for similar reasons in terms of not perhaps having an easy home life. Um, yeah, I, I certainly think it's not uncommon. I mean, even even after I, I left the Marines, um, uh, a friend of uh, someone who lives in our village was, you know, their son was looking at joining the Marines and he was saying to me, I just don't understand what's, what's sort of making them do it. And, and I, he said, oh, can, yeah, can you talk to him about what life's like in the Marines and sort of, him? so, so we did, I had a really good conversation with him. And, and, and again, when this later on, this chat was there going, yeah, I still don't know what drives him. I said, oh, I do. Yeah. He just, he just wants to prove himself. He wants to prove he's got something about him. He just wants to, you know, be measure himself against that bar and find out where he comes. That's what's driving him. So I don't think it's, it's uncommon at all. Um, and it's amazing what feelings like that can do in terms of providing a source of motivation to drive us on. Um, and it can be very powerful, I think. Yeah. But can I just take you back to the bullying? And I'll tell you why I'm, I'm asking is because when I look back at my time in school now, I think I was a bit of a bully. I don't think I was a big bully, but there were certain, you know, kids who I wasn't very nice to, who I shunned or. And I kind of look back and I can regret, yeah, that now. So mm. you're saying that you were kind of at the other end of something like that. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, I, yeah, it was, it was, it got pretty bad. I mean, I went to a couple of different schools, got bullied in both. Um, and you know, it got to the extent where. I would deliberately stay behind after school to hopefully make sure everyone else had enough time to get to their homes and therefore I could walk home without fear of being attacked. I used to have to vary the route home I took because people used to start waiting for me on the route home to basically beat me up. And so I used to have to vary which route I took home to try and avoid it. Um, uh, and yeah, I was, I was in the head of year's office quite often because I've been victim of some sort of bullying thing again. And, um, my, my teachers were brilliant. Some of my teachers really helped me get me through high school and thankfully it got a lot better at when I went, went on to do my A-levels and lots of the bullies left the education system at 16 then and, and life got a bit better, but yeah, GCSEs and stuff was, was quite hard work to get through that. Yeah. It sounds like, sounds terrible here, yeah, Nick, and reminds us that the yeah, school can be a bit of a jungle, can't it? <laughs> yes. Yes, it can. Yeah. I mean, environment's really important and it's something, um, you know, I, I try and bear in mind now as a parent is just making sure my own kids have, have a good supportive environment, a safe environment for them to find out who they are. Um, okay. So, so moving on to the Marines and obviously a much happier time for you. What were the things that you really in, in, enjoyed in the, in the bio you've sent us? It sounds like there were lots of things you really enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, I, um. I loved it. I mean, didn't find it easy at first. Didn't actually have the smoothest start, to be honest. I didn't, I didn't fit in initially. I don't think, um, I don't think I fit the mold of what people expected. I was, I was the oldest, um, officer going through training, uh, which I think again, made me a bit different. I, I, I actually, um, had a couple of issues with heat exhaustion going through training. Um, technically I, I am willing to be completely honest. I, I didn't actually technically finish my 30 minor. I woke up in hospital a day or so later. Um, but thankfully they gave me my green beret anyway. So, so, um, yeah, it's a tricky start, but once I was in, as I say that what I loved about it is all that was important really was that you were willing to do your best to make sure the person to the left and the person to right of you were going to be okay. And that meant being really good at your job. And if you weren't good at your job, it wasn't so much you're letting yourself down, you're letting down the person to the left and right of you. And obviously morally that then is real good motivation. I don't want to be the person that lets everyone down. So everyone was really striving always to deliver at their best and to be part of the whole team 
where everyone is really working hard to be part of the best is, is a fantastic experience. And obviously we all knew we were pretty capable because we've all done the commando course and we've all had similar shared experiences and, and it was, it was just great. And the, um, you know, that some of the elements, the commando spirit, you know, one of them is cheerfulness in the face of adversity. At first I thought that was a bit of a fluffy one, but after a few years, I really started to understand the value that brought because there are going to be times when we were going to be facing some difficult circumstances on operations. It might be literally life or death circumstances. And if you become negative in those situations, that perception of a negative set of circumstances becomes the reality. And so you start missing opportunities, you start missing ways to make things better. And by keeping your morale up, it just makes sure that you're always alive to, okay, that rubbish that look over there is something we can do. We can make this better. We can make that better. And when you're in a team of people that's all thinking like that and all have the capabilities to, to you know, pull something out of the bag when they're really under pressure, you can achieve some fantastic stuff. And we did, and we did achieve some amazing things in my, in my time serving in the Marines. And it was absolute, absolute pleasure. Mm. Uh, and obviously, yeah. you really hearing response, Nick, you know, that emphasis on belonging there as well in that, you know, if you're looking after the guy to your left and right and people on either side are looking after you, there's a sense of belonging and, a, and being a whole part of a whole that's bigger than you as well, which, you know, does seem to be really important for human development to have that sense of being belonging to something that's bigger than yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we rarely did certainly for me, rarely did I feel I was facing a challenge on my own. We also always had a team. Even when I was the one in command, I always had a team of people, you know, there to provide their ideas, provide their input, to own various parts of the solution. And you just know that if I'm going to give someone this, this task to do over here, they will do it to the best of their ability. And so long as they do that, we're, you know, we're all, we're all good. Um, so yeah, that, that sense of belonging was critical and it was obviously the military have certain things to help emphasize the sense of belonging you know the uniform emblems cap badges whatever it might be green beret um but that sense of belonging to a team and then the sense of what we we're able to accomplish as a result of that was was a huge source of confidence and reassurance um and it felt like really there was no challenge too big that we weren't going to be able to overcome and you can only see how something that could go one way or the other. There's a functional set of belonging in the military that actually you need that sense of belonging and being part of a bigger hub to achieve massive tasks. Whereas I think when you listen to the accounts of people who've ended up in prison and got involved in gang activity, for instance, quite often they've been looking for belonging and the, the dysfunctional gang is represented a way to to belong so it's it's really interesting to hear how there was a belonging what serves to work in a very different way where it's you know something that's very very functional yeah i mean it'd be interesting to say views on that because obviously within, within the military environment we emphasize that sense of belonging and it's very genuine my my impression is and this could be completely wrong it's not my area of expertise is that within sort of gang environment they use the desire to have that sense of belonging is a lever to draw people in, but at the same time, in actual terms, that they, they try to make sure people are isolated in some extent, so that they're always chasing this need to belong to somewhere without ever actually getting there, and that's what hooks them in. I mean, I don't know if that's a, a fair or accurate description. It's very accurate, and also that sense of isolating them from the links and connections they previously had as well so you know drawing them into something that's nefarious um but not really ever offering true belonging and the true set of community that was okay um so I, I, you spent a fairly long time up in the arctic didn't you nick what was if you can tell us it may be sort of secret what, what was that about what was it like uh, sorry, the sound got difficult. Oh, right. Yes. Repeat the question. You spent um, a, a good spell up in the Arctic. Um, in the uh, what, was, what was that like and about? <laughs> well, the, um, the Royal Marines traditionally um, were responsible for NATO's northern flank, which effectively would be Scandinavia. And, uh, and so they, would, um, de they were effectively the Arctic warfare specialists, certainly within the British forces and, and for much of NATO. So each, each year they would deploy to Norway to maintain those Arctic warfare 
capabilities. And that wasn't just moving around on skis. That was a large part of it, but the vehicles had to be maintained a different way. Equipment worked differently. You had to handle the equipment differently because um, metal in freezing cold temperatures, your skin sticks to it. So, so a whole load of um, mm. techniques and procedures and standing off even seizures. It was, it was all different. You had to drive differently. So it was actually quite a big deal. You can't, you can't just suddenly lift everyone up and go, right, we're going to do stuff in the Arctic. Actually, it's very different operating in those environmental conditions. So, so each year we'd, um, or parts of the Royal Marines would go out to Norway with a whole load of other enablers and, and supporting elements from across defense, from helicopters and naval ships and all sorts of stuff, uh, to make sure they maintained that that organizational awareness of what it takes to operate in the Arctic, what some of the challenges are, so that when we were facing, should we ever face um, a combat situation in the Arctic, we knew what some of the operational constraints were, we knew what some of the frictions were we needed to integrate in our plan. Um, as a testing ground, it was fantastic. I mean, it's a bit of a rite of passage for Royal Marine to go to Norway, as you can imagine. Um, and you, it, it adds a whole load of complexity. You know, soldiering can be demanding at the best of times, but operating in extreme environments like that adds a whole level of complexity. Um, some people that are really, really strong when it comes to walking with heavy kit across uh, moorland or through forests, you know, it turns out they're not the best skiers. So, <laughs> but, so you know, you, you have to factor that in. We had, had one guy, I'll never forget it. He was, he was, he was definitely one of the strongest people um, I'd come across the Marines, but he was... He was terrible at skiing. He was South African, so so they would let him off. And um, we were, he was falling over every few minutes. There was one occasion where he, he'd fallen over about the fifth time in about 25 minutes, and he just got up, took his skis off, got his ski poles, and he just was just hitting all the undergrowth and shrubbery around him in frustration. And my guy was like, oh, uh, should we step in? He's like, no, 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 let, we'll just let him get it out, let him get it out. <laughs> <laughs> Before he righted himself. And we all cracked on, but... I say everyone just needs to appreciate the fact that, yes, some people might be really strong in some environments, but when you go to a, a testing environment like that, because it's so much is different, then other strengths come to the fore, other capabilities come to the fore. Um, so again, a really, a really great set testing ground for, for illustrating the fact that, that we're only as strong as our, as our weakest member, and that, and that might not be who we think it is. So there are a lot of challenges, and obviously part of the training was to help me become adaptable to virtually any kind of situation or circumstance. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge part of it is about mindset and we spoke about, you know, cheerfulness in the face of adversity before as one, um, but courage and determination to see. So, so no matter what environment you're put into having that mindset of like, no matter, no matter what problem we face under what conditions we face it, we have the capabilities within our team to deliver a great outcome. We just need to apply ourselves and make sure it's there. So, so going in with that healthy mindset of, look, there is a solution here somewhere enables you to, or encourages you to, to look for solutions and therefore adapt as you need to. And there, there was a phrase, um, quite common, certainly during my time in mentoring, be the first to understand the first to adapt and the first to overcome, you know, that just emphasizes that, that healthy mindset of, of adapt and overcome essentially. So all of these things must have uh, helped you develop skills in leadership and management, I guess. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we obviously as a, in the military, there's a lot of leadership management training anyway, um, starting from your first initial training, whether, whether you're an officer or not, um, arguably there's potentially more of it if you're an officer, because you will be going into leadership management roles. Um, and. Yeah, there, there was some extensive training, um, but a lot of the training also was, was what I guess we call on the job training. So that there are the formal bits. Yes, you go away on a course for X amount of weeks. And some of it was quite long. Initial officer training in Royal Marines was 15 months for me. And later on, there was another three week segment, another two week segment. And, you know, eventually later on in my career, there was staff college, which was another sort of nine, 10 months. So there's a lot of formal training of a long period. It's quite intensive. But equally, there's a lot of informal on the job training when you're learning from mentors, you're learning about operating in new environments and you're, you're seeing your team under pressure in new ways. And so you're learning about how pressure impacts your team. And so you're picking this stuff up all the time. And because you're being pushed into these new environments under pressure quite consistently in the military, 
the oppor- the learning opportunities are constant if you're willing to look for them. So you do you do pick up loads. Um, I remember one you know one of the great things I I I learned really early on was when I first went through training, we got given this sort of vague memoir, and I remember my sort of going right. When, when you do orders, you have to write something for every heading in there. So, okay. And obviously as a deer in the headlights at that point, you take that verbatim. So, and I always used to struggle. There were some headings. It's like, well, I can't think of anything to write there. So you kind of try and wedge something in to make it work. And it meant really when I was giving instructions to my team, it just didn't flow. It didn't fit. And it was only much later in my career. I just kind of, I'd had enough really. And I went, right, right. no, not having it. That heading doesn't work. That one doesn't work. What I do want, I've got, I've got this to say. So I need a heading like this, and I'd start making up my own. So finally, I had the confidence to apply what I thought I needed, and what I thought was going to work in this situation. And the moment I got to that level of confidence, that to 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 not treat things as dogma, but more as guidance, stuff really started to improve for me, and I think my career sort of took off from there. So, so you know, I'm really passionate now about people finding their own way, uh, finding what works for them. You know, I always laugh when there's these things on social media, like, you know, the f- all five leaders of these things. It's like, no, they're not. No, some, some, some great leaders, of those five things and some great leaders look completely different and that's fine. Um, so yeah, I'm really, you know, that was one of the key lessons that I sort of stumbled across fairly early on in my career. Uh, beyond that, you know, later in my career, I learned about strategy. I got almost accidentally exposed to defense strategy. Um, and through a project that was pretty rubbish at the time, actually, we it really highlighted to me what a good strategy should do. And you know, this the work we were doing was highlighting how something as high level as UK defence strategy, you know, so really top level, the government was instructing the Ministry of Defence to deliver this stuff. If you filtered that logic all the way down, it, it told you how many bits of a certain piece of equipment we should have, or how many chefs we needed within the uh, you know whatever part of the military I was working in, or or how many vehicles or how many well, aircraft carriers ultimately. So, so, you know, a great lesson on the function of strategy through my military career during on the job training to highlight the fact that actually strategy shouldn't sit on the shelf and go, just everyone sort of go, yes, yes, there's our strategy. It's there. Look, no, no, a strategy should be off the shelf referred to regularly because it should guide every decision technically that you're making your business. So yeah, learned a huge amount about leadership and management, both formally and informally. Thank you. I think we're all familiar. I think we're all familiar with that nightmare of trying to fit things into boxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why did you leave? Um, good question. So I, I, I still loved, um, being an officer in the Romneys at that point, but by that stage, my, you know, my life had moved on. I wasn't that idealistic single young guy in their twenties by that point. I was now, uh, a father to, um, to, to my daughter. I was, I was a husband. And so I had, I had a different set of priorities now. So I had more things sort of tugging me in a different direction. Uh, and I got to a point where I thought because the military is a lifestyle as much as this is a, as there's a job, you have to, you have to really commit to it or not. And I thought, well, I will. I'm willing to keep committing to the military and moving my family around every 18 to 24 months and making it difficult for my wife to have a career because we moved around 18 to 24 months, um, potentially disrupting my daughter's schooling, all that sort of stuff. I was willing to take that if I felt I could make a, continue to make a significant difference. So, um, so I had basically had a chat with my War Marines, uh, careers officer effectively. And, and the conversation was essentially the short version was. Well, you're a bit old when you joined the Royal Marines, Nick, so you're always going to struggle a little bit to compete with your peers. And I was a bit surprised because I had a quite good pack by this point and a pretty decent skill set. So I was also a sort of communications and information systems officer as well. So I thought, oh, maybe, maybe the Navy wants to push me down the sort of cyber route. Um, uh, but really, that, that was seemingly all, all they could see. So I thought, well, if I'm not, if I'm not on a level playing field because of my age still, despite having tried to overcome that for the previous 10 years or so, um, then... I can probably do better outside of military and not have all that impact on my family. So, so my priorities changed was a key part of that. Thank you. Sorry, no. I I was just wondering how old you were when you did join the Marines, Nick. Uh, 25. So I decided I wanted to be a Royal Marines officer when I was 23. 
Um, but because there's only one intake a year, the first time I didn't get selected, the second time I did. Um, so I was 25 when I started, but I was hit my 26th birthday only about two and a half months after we started training. So, and 26 was the cutoff. You had to be less than 26 to start off the training. So you're not, it's not like you're decades older. Um, in, than people starting out, so no, it seems a no, bit I mean, unfortunate that that there was a set of tick box, there was a tick box there that affected your your promotional opportunities. Yeah, I mean there, there was a there was a cold hard logic to it, so I didn't particularly argue it. Um, because there are certain things in the military that indicate you know that they can get more years out of you if you're younger, basically. So it's almost in their favour to develop younger personnel within a victory because they they've got more mileage. So, so as I say, I didn't particularly argue it. I didn't feel, feel it was worth arguing. I, I, I accepted the system and how it works. And as I say, when one door closes, it opens up a whole load of other opportunities. And I now do stuff I really enjoy and able to give more, more time to my family than I think I otherwise would have done. So I still miss it occasionally, gotta be honest. I'd, you know, particularly my jobs actually in the Royal Marines themselves were Everyone was a fantastic experience, but, you know, as I say, there's other stuff to do now. Just before we come to what you're doing now, I was, just, I was curious about, you know, you've referred a lot to the mindset and this kind of like, it seems like quite a deliberate, intentional inculcation of is your mindset that's, that's going to be effective. And I wondered how much of that mindset you'd had in you originally, how much was that? You, you still seem like a very positive person, and I wondered how much of that was something that you, you brought into your military career already, or how much of that was something that developed through this habitual reference to these this way of being. Oh, well, that's a good question. Never consider that. I mean, I think I think I've generally been a fairly optimistic person most of my life. Um, as I said before, not necessarily a confident one. Certainly, didn't start out confident. What I did have very early on was this huge determination to, to get in and say, I decided I wanted to be a Royal Marines officer when I was 23, went through the first round of selection processes, passed them both, but didn't make the cut. Had the determination going, look, this is really what I want. So I'm going to try and roll the dice again, Hope, yeah, go again. Uh, so then had to do the selection processes again. Uh, then obviously made it that time, got into training. Um, training was tricky. Uh, you know, it was very demanding. It is, is for everyone, not everyone makes it. Uh, the issues with heat exhaustion didn't help. Um, I got blisters on fairly early on, on the final exercise. And it got to the point where literally the blisters were covering the entire entirety of the sole of my feet. And basically when I had to get up to start walking, you could feel that uh, I hope no one's eating, me. but but you could feel the, uh, the fluid under the skin prizing apart the skin, either side of my foot, you know, it was, it was pretty painful to walk on, but. I really, 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 really wanted to be Royal Marines Commando. So, you know, that's just something I endured for as long as possible. So, so I had, a, I had the determination, I think, from the start, certainly. Um, a lot of the other stuff was probably there, but the, the Marines enabled me to build it up, I'd say, to a high level. Um, that optimism is easier. That cheerfulness in the face of adversity is easy when you're in a team. The military as a whole, I won't single this out for the Marines, uh, the military as a whole is one big team. Um, you know, this, this drive for excellence and standards is something I think was there before because I wanted to prove myself. So, so delivering good outcomes, something that was there mm -hmm. before and integrity, I think always mattered a lot to me, um, as well. And, and all the elements of the military, um, pride themselves on, on having integrity. So yeah, some of it was there, but to be put in an environment where that is very consciously put front and center of this is who we are, this is what we're about, helped, I think, that to develop naturally to a greater extent. Thank you. And Nick, strong inspirational leadership in our military is the kind of stuff that movies are made of. Is this the reality? <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, well, obviously, yeah, you, you need stuff for movies, right? You need to make it short, intense. Wow, that's really exciting. Um, and I definitely met leaders that were really, really great at going out and you know, giving a great rousing speech to the, to the troops. And I saw leaders who were brilliant and did some exceptional 
acts of courage in the face of danger and under fire. And, and that was brilliant. Um, but what I, what I found and what I concluded was, um, as amazing as they are, as flashes of brilliance, they're not necessarily as reliable an indicator of great leadership as the small things people do every day. And the, the best leaders I came across were those that in the most innocuous of circumstances, which would just be great people. You know, they'd be empathetic, they'd be conscious leaders, they'd understand the impacts of the decisions they were making, they'd make sure people feel listened to, um, they practice what they preached every day. Even if it's little things like, you know, turning off the lights of the, the office when, you know, if you're the last person out. You know, if you're going to tell people that's important, you need to show people that it's important for you to do it too. You know, it was those small interactions that we do throughout our day were a much better indicator of someone's standard of a leader than, than these smash, uh, you know, flashes of, of brilliance. And equally, I, I, there were some leaders that actually I'd go to say were terrible leaders, but because occasionally they came up with this flash of brilliance, there were individuals within the org like, oh yeah, but that person did that. Yeah. But the rest of the time, everyone that, you know, they're involved with is miserable and, and hating their job. Yeah. But they did, they did that great thing. It's, it was so so occasionally flashes of brilliance can mask bad leadership. So I'd much rather look at the small stuff to judge character. Thank you. Yes, I think it's, it's important, isn't it? That sense of being consistent and being able to do it on a daily basis, even if it's not in a spectacular way, matters a lot. Yeah, I think it's about being genuine and being authentic. Um, you know, you, the, the, your, your authentic self you can't really mask that a hundred percent of the time. So there will be, you know, if you're, if you're trying to be something you're not, that, that mask is going to slip at some, um, so, so yeah, I think the day to day stuff, as I say, over time, you get a far better judge of someone's character to the small stuff. Thank you. And what, what did you take from, you know, what lessons about leadership, um, did you take from from the Bing and Brains that you've applied in your career since you've left? Uh, probably. So learned a lot, but I wonder how you're using yeah. that knowledge now. Well, well, the biggest, the biggest thing I took away from it is, um, that leadership management changes lives. It really does, you know, so, so I had, I would say I had a couple of brushes with toxic leadership in my military career. Um, and one of them was, was more significant than the other. But I, I would walk through the door of my home during that period and I could feel the atmosphere in my house change. I could feel um, my wife walk on eggshells and my then three-year-old daughter seemed to sort of change the behavior a little bit. And, and so I became really conscious of, look, I've had a really rubbish day at work again. Uh, I'm constantly stressed. I'm thinking about stuff all the time. I'm not present with my family. And I can feel it impacting the house and my family the moment I walked in. I was like, this isn't right. The, the epiphany, um, actually, this was one of the instances that, made me realize maybe my time in the Marines had or military had come to an end, but I went for a dog walk with my daughter at the weekend and we walk on sort of some moorlands, not too far from the house. And I was completely not present at this point. And I suddenly looked up and I was sort of looking around for a western dog. And she's about 50 meters behind me picking blackberries off a bush, which is fine. So no, no danger here. Uh, but I hadn't noticed she had dropped all the way back because I had been thinking about the yet again, difficult thing. I was going to have to rave in my boss that I was not sure how to play and not sure of what impact or blowback there was going to be from it. And, and that was the point where I was like, this is right. I shouldn't, I shouldn't not be able to go on the dog walk with my daughter at the weekend. So, so leadership and management within the workplace reverberates throughout our lives much more widely and has an impact on relationships beyond that. And I saw people who Literally, you know, their relationships started to get into trouble and, and they didn't have great close relationships with their kids. So that was one of the biggest things I learned. And the other one obviously is that this stuff impacts, impacts all of us. You know, we, we all experience leadership and management in our lives to some extent, which is probably why someone said to me the other day, why do people keep banging on about leadership and management? So, well, it's a good question, but probably because it is the thing that we are all impacted by. We all have a boss at work or we all need to work with other people at work. And so how we're we'll, we're managed depends on how well that relationship and dynamic works. And if it's one that frustrates us every time and we come home frustrated and stressed out, 
And then we're dreading going to work on the Monday. So we're grumpy on the Sunday afternoon thinking on the Monday morning, you know, that, that impacts us. Um, so, so yeah, they were probably the biggest lessons. I mean, one, the, one, the, I'll say my third and final one, unless you want me to do some more, cause I've got loads of these is, uh, how important moral courage is for, for me, that is the most important trait a leader needs to, or anyone actually, to, to be honest, needs to develop. And I think you need it because you need courage to look inwardly into ourselves. Okay. So what am I? good at what am I not so good at? You need to be willing to accept that we're not so good at stuff. Sometimes that takes courage. Um, and once you've accepted that, okay, so I'm not so good at these things that then enables you to build a team around you that can help you mitigate some of the areas you're not so great at, but unless you're willing to ad admit and have the courage to look inward and admit you're not so great at stuff, then, then that's an issue. So that's the role of courage in terms of understanding who we are as people and therefore how we might need to operate. But then more widely, obviously, um, when we're in positions of, of leadership and we have formal authority and responsibility for those in our care, doing the right thing can be really scary. And, you know, you've had some brilliant people on, on this podcast who have had the moral courage to speak up when no one else was, and, and they've had to go through some incredibly difficult experiences and, and the consequences of that can be can be significant on, on the individual speaking up and, um, it can take a toll, uh, general slim, uh, so he was a general in the second world war. He, he's does a good speech on this. He said that it's really important as a leader that you don't care too much about your job, you know, or not about losing it. You shouldn't care too much about losing your job. It says, you know, it's not to say don't do a good job. Obviously you should try and do your best, but if your priority becomes keeping your job above doing the right thing you are going to compromise your ability to, to be an effective leader. And I think that's a very true statement from uh, General Slim there. I think that's a brilliant quote. You know, when I think back on our conversations with Peter Duffy and Eileen Chuck, for instance, that actually has been yeah. had leaders that were able to do the right thing, then actually things would have been, you know, battered in terms of people's, people's lives actually in, in both those cases. So thank you. That's a, it's a fantastic quote to share. Nid, in terms of the organisations you're working with now and the kind of challenges they face, is it those same three areas that you tend to find that you're working to develop people on or, or are you drawing on? Are there any familiar problems that these organisations have? Uh, I mean, the organisations we're with now are varied. I mean, I'd say the majority are probably small, medium enterprises. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a difference between the kind of support we're providing. So if it's on a more individual basis, a lot of it is about leadership and encouraging people to, um, to have that moral courage really, and to look inwardly and be comfortable with, with saying, okay, this is what we're great at. This is what we're not so great at. Which again, organization is really important. You can't pretend your organization is brilliant at everything. Cause otherwise you're gonna be carrying huge risks somewhere going, no, I know we're great at that actually. <laughs> That's about to fall over. We need to be, be able to accept that that's about to fall over so we can shore it up. But what I, I really enjoy uh, about the work we do now is, is helping people understand the role of, of management in great leadership. So what fascinates me is that you, you look out at the, all the literature on leadership, management, loads out there about leadership because it's very emotive and people love the idea of being this great, inspiring leader. Management always seems to get step and fiddle. Uh, and I'm never quite sure why this is because certainly throughout all of my career, I have found management is a, is an equal partner to, to leadership. So if, if leadership's about emotions and motivating people and inspiring them and energizing a team, management is all about, yeah, okay, but how are we actually going to do that? And you can inspire someone and then lead the room. And then if the moment you lead the room, when everyone actually tries to do the thing you've asked them to do, they, you know, they've got issues with their equipment. The process isn't right. They're wasting time and effort and they're not achieving the standards they thought. People are going to get pretty annoyed pretty quickly and all the inspiration in the world isn't going to last very long. And um, what's really interesting is even little things like people, people seem to overlook the, the management tools we all have available. Things like a meeting agenda, really powerful tool. If you put some thought and effort into your meeting agenda, got someone who's not willing to, you know, nervous about speaking up in a meeting, give them an agenda item to own and encourage them to start speaking more in a meeting and. Yeah, eventually they'll build up their confidence and it's lovely to see. Got someone who 
uh, you know, never stops talking during a meeting and seems to hog, hog the floor a little bit, then make sure you go, okay, no, you know, give an agenda item, but all members of the team to contribute. So everyone has an opportunity to say something. Um, policy and process. I love, I love talking to people about policy and process. They all think it's boring. Uh, it is boring, but what we've got to remember is policy and process is the leadership when the leaders leave the room, right? So, so all this stuff we for say, oh, you know, we're an empowering organization. We empower our people. Oh, that's interesting because this policy over here says that in order for this to happen, you need to get sign off from that person, that person, that person, that person. Like, you know, how was that empowering me? Oh, well, I've never looked at it like that. Um, so I, I love helping organizations make sure that the, the leadership that typically is, is actually pretty good in most organizations and certainly very genuine in terms of what they're trying to achieve is supported by all these management tools that the governance frameworks are in place and support it, that the management tools are in place and support it, policy and process supports it. That actually, they don't have a strategy that's their, their and namesake only. The strategy is actually based on their business, their sector, what's coming down the track, things they might need position for, and that informs and is translated into an operational plan. You now, it's, it's fantastic stuff. And when people start realizing, oh, so I always thought this was a bit of a dark art. No, 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 actually, this is stuff we're all really capable of. It's just everyone seems to make it look like a dark art, but it isn't. You know, we're all perfectly capable of this stuff and we're able to do it well. The trick is finding what works well for you. Thank you. Friend, so Nick, I think you've um, rightly put uh, moral courage at the center of your description uh, yeah, today. Would you say that's the main similarity between the work that you did in the Marines and the work that you do now? Or? Are there other similarities as well? Well, I think for, for me, moral courage is really a code for life, I think. Um, so it apply everywhere. But, you know, the work I do now is predominantly with businesses um, and sort of senior leaders. And what, what I always found entertaining is that sometimes I'd, I'd go out and talk about, you know, lessons from the military and some people would be like, oh, it doesn't apply here though because we're a business and that's the military. It's completely different. And I always enjoy this one because, well, actually, you know, certainly the UK military, it's basically a 500 year old business. We have a legal department in military, you know, we have, we have HR, we've got compliance, we've got operations, we've got logistics element, we've got comms element, you know, the military is essentially a 500 year old business. So, so it, it, it all, I always found it entertaining when people say there is, can't be any similarity between military and business. Yet there's stacks. And I say what we all love in the military working in offices as well. Um, most of us work in offices and we have computers just like lots of people. In fact, we love offices so much we go to loads of effort to build our offices, even when you're operating in the middle of the Arctic and you stick out some tents and put some computers in that too. You know, so, so there are loads of similarities between the military and business. The, the differences are maybe in the military, because of what they do, they deliberately put themselves in... Um, What's now? I want to change how that way I'm going to phrase that. The military know that they need to make sure everyone can operate in high pressure environments. They put a lot of work into training people to operate in high pressure environments. And that um, potentially doesn't happen quite so much in uh, a business sense. You know, if you do arrange a training course in a business, you don't necessarily go, right, let's put people under loads of pressure. Uh, you know, often the training courses are quite a nice break from, from the routine. So, um, yeah, perhaps that's, perhaps that's a, uh, a slight difference is that, is that we're constantly putting ourselves under pressure in military to drive us to high standards. Whereas in business, you're, it's understandably so, you, you know, because for, you have to be aware of the bottom line. You have to make sure the business is profitable. Um, it, it has a different emphasis, I think. Thank you. So, so that's very interesting. This uh, issue around the offices and building offices wherever you go. <laughs> And that's an interesting uh, insight into this 500 year old business. Uh, so uh, I think you've been in, in, uh, combat, haven't you? I think you were in Afghanistan. Was it twice? Yeah. So deployed to Afghanistan twice. Um, uh, and really interesting for me, I actually went back to pretty much exactly the same area each time. And it was fascinating to see how, how it had evolved between the first deployment and the second, um, uh, yeah, really, a really interesting space to be. Was I directly involved in combat? Did I have bullets going left and right of me and bombs going off and stuff? Um, kind of, I led patrols that came, came under fire. Uh, but I, again, because of my role, I was the officer. So my job was to make sure I knew 
what was going on in the wider context and around us. So I wasn't necessarily looking, well, I didn't look through my rifle sight once, I don't think, but I was commanding my troops and was making sure I knew where people were on the ground by looking at the map and listening to reports over the radio and instructing my troops to maneuver in certain directions to, to win the firefight essentially, and hopefully make sure we all got back safely. So I was involved in combat operations, but I, I didn't necessarily have, uh, as I say, um, wasn't necessarily looking down my rifle. Yeah, I think that counts. <laughs> well, it must be a horrible level of responsibility to have for other people's well-being whilst, whilst there as well. Uh, horrible is an interesting word. I, I wouldn't say it was, it was horrible. Obviously, we were trained for it. It's something I joined the Marines to do, was to have that level of responsibility. Uh, and we were incredibly well prepared for it. Um, and we're part of a team where we all know our role within that context. You know, we've been trained to go into that exact situation and we've been trained to deliver our roles within that exact situation. So when you find yourself in that situation, it doesn't feel horrible. It feels, um, or felt to me, sorry, expected, um, not normal. That's not right because obviously I haven't been in that situation before, but, but it felt like we were all doing what we were meant to do and, and we were working in the way we were meant to as a team. So it felt manageable. It felt okay. I suppose I was thinking that if things went wrong, that could feel quite, you know, that could be quite a heavy burden to. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, um, so I did do the orders for a patrol that we took out and, uh, on that patrol, we did have um, some fatalities caused by a rocket propelled grenade. And I was involved in the casualty extraction for that. Um, and that, that, that did weigh on my mind a little bit in terms of, I gave the orders for this patrol and we've had two fatalities. Um, but I guess I was just doing my role. Uh, I was doing the job I was meant to do. The casualty evacuation procedure actually worked very well, which was great because that means I'd covered that part off properly when given those orders. But yeah, you, you do, you do feel a keen responsibility, rightly so, and we should do, otherwise we probably shouldn't be there. A keen responsibility for the people that you're leading into harm's way effectively. And so when stuff goes wrong, you know, I suppose the only moral salve we can offer ourselves is did, did I do everything I can knowing that risk was there to minimize it or in the event in which that risk is realized to, to reduce the severity of it as much as possible. And I think we, I think we did. And I'm very proud actually of, of all the guys that were involved in the casualty evacuation on that event. I suppose, you know, leading on from that last question about how, you know, things, things might at times weigh heavy. I, w I just wonder how you've kept yourself emotionally well and happy over the course of your career. You know, what kind of advice would you give? To, I just that mindset might feature here, but I, I wonder what advice you give to listeners about how to keep themselves in a more positive place, even when things might be hard. Uh, I mean, I, 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 get, I wouldn't want to tell anyone how to do it. I, I can share what, what's worked and what hasn't worked for me. I mean, what, one of the, my life mm -hmm. mantra has essentially become, I think, in my early thirties, I, I kind of realized this and decided, right, it's going to be my mantra from now on, uh, is that there's opportunity in everything. And I kind of got to that point because even by that point, looking back, I went to all the time, something really, I thought really rubbish had happened to me and that this was a massive setback. And I was, um, I wasn't getting the same opportunities as everyone else. I was being unfairly disadvantaged compared to everyone else. Actually, that, that was almost every time the thing that led me then to achievements that I am then incredibly proud of. Um, so some examples were, uh, when I first qualified as a brand new Royal Marines officer, went to my first job, we were meant to be mentors by our troop sergeant, who's the most senior sort of non-commissioned rank in, in the troop. Now my troop sergeant was never there because he was always off doing training because he had these rare training qualifications. So he was always being pulled away to do these things. So at first I was like, well, that's unfair, is it? In my first job as a Royal Marines officer, I'm not getting the person that's meant to mentor me. But actually what that enabled was I, I had to work really, really closely with my junior leaders. And that was fantastic because it meant I then had a much closer relationship to those I led because I was missing the troop sergeant and going straight down the level. And it, I learned the importance of junior leaders in, 
in any team. You know, they're the people that really need to make stuff work. So I learned fantastic lessons from that that set me up for success later on. That strategy project was another one I said at the top, you know, that wasn't a fun thing to be involved in at the time, but I learned so much about strategy and, um, sort of organizational design and training capabilities. That was what gave me the knowledge then that I used to deliver the international training event you mentioned in the intro that I ended up getting the MB. So all these things that at the time just felt rubbish, um, actually enabled me or gave me something that I could use later on to open new doors and achieve new things that I hadn't even really thought of at the time. You know, so I, I, I say that's, that could be part of mindset, but I'd encourage people really when, whenever bad things happen is, is look for the opportunity because I'm willing to bet there's one in there somewhere. Um, beyond that, it, it might sound a small thing, but certainly for me, physical exercise is a massive one for me. And I think this is a part of, I thought about this a lot. Why does exercise matter so much to me? And this, it was rammed home during COVID. Uh, I didn't do as much when co the pandemic mm -hmm. first hit and, um, it was only later on when I started to get back into exercise again, and I suddenly realized I felt loads, loads better. I was like, oh, God, right. You know what? I, I, I had missed that I was getting really down and grumpy and lacking motivation and actually exercise is important. I think for me, it's about maintaining that standard, um, feeling like, look, no matter what else happens, at least I can always do this. Or <laughs> it sounds really vain. Oh, what is this? But you know, I can walk into a room and go, well, you know, there's going to be some amazing people in here who've done loads of stuff better than me, but you know, I can still crack out a good number of pull-ups. So that's all right. So <laughs> probably not the worst in the room at pull-ups and, uh, or even just knowing we're in good shape is just, um, it just helps you have that little bit of confidence when I go into a work meeting to go, oh, you know, feel, feeling good today. And you know, it just somewhere there's some part of me that goes, I can feel good about that. Um, enables me to just be a little bit more positive. I think when I go into, into a room, so. Yeah, I suppose exercise and opportunities and everything uh, as a mindset have been very, very useful. Thank you. And I'm not sure about the, the, I can't relate to the idea of feeling like I'm excelling at some kind of physical activity, but certainly <laughs> the, looking for the opportunity in, in um, you know, situations that don't, that might feel a bit, a bit um, uncomfortable. Um, you really reminds me of one of my favourite books is by Bruce Feiler uh, called Life is in the Transitions and he he interviewed hundreds of people about their lives and actually when he got them talking about crisis points in their life which might be things like having cancer um, you know losing someone to a bereavement actually what 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 helps people manage those transitions and those crisis points is being able to find the the learning and the opportunity that's buried there, even though this is like quite a dark time for people. It's a fantastic book that I think everybody should should read. So, Nick, thank you very much for coming on the podcast today and sharing um, all the wisdom that you that you took from your time. <laughs> wisdom's the very it's been really really nice, really nice to talk to you. Pleasure. No, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Great stuff, Nick. Real pleasure meeting you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David.